Hello and you're all very welcome along to Season 5, Episode 17 of the Champ Dolly E Podcast. Ireland's premier horse racing podcast in association with Boyle Sports, Gorham Park Racecourse and Syndicate Start Racing. Coming up on this week's show, Barry speaks to special guest Derek Fox about Grand National winner Corrick Rambler and star of the future Apple Away. The lads look ahead to five key races at Warwick, Kempton and Fairy House, as well as giving their best bets for this weekend. What a great performance here. Apple away and Stephen Mulqueen chased all the way by Maximilian on the run for home. There's two lengths between them. Stay away, Faye in a Roco third and fourth. Apple away, eyes out, all out, and to the line. Apple away makes it all. What a brave win from Maximilian. If you haven't already, be sure to like this video and subscribe to the Champ.ie YouTube channel as it helps to get horse racing content out there to the wider audience. We look forward to reading all your weekend hashtag 5 cast selections in the comments below. Sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Boil Sports. Don't just bet. Choose wisely. Hello and you're all very welcome along to Champ.ie and we've got another great podcast to look forward to this week. We're going to be looking at races from Warwick, Kempton, Fairy House and of course we have uh, got plenty to get through as well. We'll have a couple of uh, very special guests on the show including uh, Derek Fox and also we'll be speaking to Henry Beebe from Goffs as we get closer to the uh, Tiestes Day. And don't forget as well to like, subscribe and comment on the channel and of course enter your five cast selections that are most important and of course uh, next week just if you keep entering those five casts and the races that we have this week, well, it's the Hampton Novice Chase. It's a great two at Warwick. Another at Warwick is the three o'clock on Saturday. And then at Fairy House, the Dan Moore Memorial Handicap Grade 3, the Silviaco Conti, Conti Chase, uh, Grade 2 at Kempton, and the Lanzarote Handicap Hurdle is at Kempton on Saturday. It's a 2.40. And uh, do stay and keep your ears open for a very, very nice prize that we're going to give away uh, next week. And, of course, to be in with a chance, just enter your selections in the five casts. Joining me this week, Ronan Groom, as always, and we're delighted to welcome David Jennings of the Racing Post. Uh, Barry has just uh, recovered from a gelding operation, and uh, before the Tiestes, the decision will be made whether cheek pieces or blinkers will be fitted for his live appearance in Gorham Park, ground dependent. He'll be back next week, but we'll hear him later on with Derek Fox. Uh, gentlemen, uh, how are you, firstly? Um, great to have you on the show. Um, David, great to have you with us this week, and Ronan also. Um, a really good weekend of racing, firstly, to look forward to, David. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm better than Barry by the sounds of things anyway. Uh, that sounds very <laughs> sore. Uh, great weekend. Uh, I suppose last week we were deprived a little bit. I suppose you had you had the, the, the feast at Christmas and then you had a bit of a famine last week. But somewhere in between this week and obviously the great one at, at days on Friday to look forward to. And uh, plenty of action, both sides of the Irish Sea over the weekend. I actually like this Saturday. I like racing at Kempton. And uh, I like that Sylvan Iaco Conti chase. So very much looking forward to it. And of course, Ronan, we almost had a 100% uh, strike rate last week with no racing on. So uh, we'll <laughs> put it down as another really successful weekend for us. Yeah, well, we'll take anything we can get, David. Yeah, but I echo what uh, David says. I, like, it, it's, um, it's, it's three really good handicaps we have in the five cast. I, I always like them. I think they're real good uh, puzzles to try and solve. The Lanzarote over Kempton, obviously the classic chase is a, a real slog as well. And uh, the Dan Moore is always a race I like to have a go at as well. Kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, sometimes you have a feeling that you, a feeling about a race that you just like it and you fancy your chances to back the winner, which maybe is too much for me, but uh, I'm waiting to have a good crack at that. And obviously, as David said, looking forward to seeing Banbridge and uh, out for the first time this season though the rain probably we'll talk about it i guess in a bit there's a lot of rain forecast for kempton so i wonder would that affect those plans uh, but uh, all in all it looks like a great weekend yeah and of course as well we'll have a, a little word later on the lawlers of nays taking place on friday after the meeting uh, was called off and a couple of uh, topics as well to get through in the show just later on as we go through it so if uh, you haven't got yourself a nice cup of tea or maybe something stronger, why not do so now and sit back and enjoy uh, the next hour or so with us here on Champ. E. Right, lads, let's kick off because we've got a, quite a lot to get through in the show. We're going to look ahead to the first race of our five cast races. And we start off with the grade two at Warwick, uh, the 225 on Saturday. It's the Hampton Novice Chase. David, as you're our special guest this week, we'll give you first dibs uh, on how you see this race going. I think it's it's a cracker. I do. I think I think we're going to learn plenty. That's the first thing to say. I was delighted to see Broadway Boy, Apple Away, and uh, Grey Dawning all stand their ground. And I suppose with the change of man in there as well, he adds a little bit of intrigue because 
he obviously fell um he fell at Sandown last time against AWFA and Giovinco but like he seemed to be at the time traveling every bit as well as anything in the race so you don't really know what you're going to get with the changing man but look I'm a I'm a big Apple away fan um I, I just I think she's very very good and I thought We've seen the benefit of our of our second run over fences, uh, the benefit she got from our first run over fences when she won at Leicester. Look, she didn't have to beat much. She was evens. Making your mind up was six to four was probably short enough in the day. But I just thought she got into a rhythm early. She enjoyed herself. She was attacking our fences. And it was exactly the confidence booster you needed after seeing her at Haydock. She has a good bit of ground to make up, obviously, 14 lengths and grey dawning from their clash house at Haydock. But I just thought it was very much a first day at school for her that day. It was an education. It was all about learning that day. That wasn't her cup final. I think there are targets for her in the spring, particularly at Aintree. I think that three mile novice chase at Aintree could be right up her street. But uh, I think she's going to reverse that form with Grey Dawning. And I think Apple Away can be another big Saturday winner for Lucinda Russell. Yeah, quite like it. And you'll hear more about uh, my thoughts on that one later on in the show. Ronan, it's a, it's a good race, isn't it? What, what, uh, what sticks out for you? Are you with... Uh... Uh, David, on this one, or have you uh, sided with something else for the race? Uh, it, it is an excellent race. Only five runners before them have a real chance. Um, I think David was kind of mentioning it there with the changing man. I just thought he was the interesting one from a pricing perspective here. Um, like Obviously, he's got to come back from a fall but, or an unseat even, but uh, that was quite early in a good race against Stayaway Fay and Giovinco. He, he, like, he couldn't have tell he was going to be in there at the end, but he definitely wasn't done with at the time. And uh, obviously, if you go back to the race before that Stayaway Fay, he looked to have him beaten at Exeter only for that, um, for the Nichols horse just to come back up and outstay him on the run. And, but it was a really good start uh, over fences. So I just think he's a bit overpriced against the three. I've granted the three of them there, they all have reasonable claims but it, you know the prices I'm seeing here now I thought he was a bit overpriced uh, of the top three of the betting like Broadway boys coming away from Cheltenham so maybe that's a little bit of a question he has to answer but uh, interesting to see him again he's obviously had a great season so far uh, and looked like a really solid operator Grey Dawning he probably would have won at Cheltenham last day if he doesn't make that mistake um, uh, late on there um, against Ginny's Destiny and he's coming back to uh, Warwick where he he won on this card last season, didn't he, on, on similar type of ground. So it's a lot going for him. And Apple away, yeah, take take DJ's point that um, it might have been a school day first time out, but she does have a bit to find here. She gets a few more pounds off Grey Dawning this time. So uh, I think that, not, I'm not saying the jury's out with her, but she, I think she has a little bit to prove on that form. She will have to come forward a lot. Looking forward to seeing her again. But if, the, if, if for the five cast purposes, I'll go with the changing man. I just thought he was a little bit overpriced, albeit he has to come back from uh, an unseat. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting race. I'd be with Apple away in the race myself. I, I think she's got a, a very, very good chance and she could be a very much above average as the season goes on. Right, let's move on. And uh, I we have our second race to look forward to. This is a three mile five classic handicap chase and premier race as well at three o'clock on Saturday at Warwick. Ronan, what what one, what way would you like to play in this one? And where uh, do you see the main, main uh, uh, participants in this race coming from? Yeah, an absolutely cracking renewal. I think you know we're going five to one kind of the field there. Connor Stone Walsh on Melina Girl for Gavin Cromwell. Like she was just travelling real sweet the last day. Um, again, look, it's it's an early fall. You can't say for sure what was going to happen, but she looked to be travelling really well, and she can run here off the same marks. You can see why she's in a favourite. Um, Gucci Pan Colange is there for Charlie Longston. Ran well in the race last season. Comes into the race in good form this time around. So you know the course and distance know how is there, which is always. Appeal. I was just going to look down the bottom in the market here just because it was so. I just could make a case for loads of them. And I, when I got to the likes of uh, per- percussion here, I just thought he was interesting off a uh, mark of 131. Like he was five pounds out of the handicap because um, the uh, Coco Beach, the Troy Town winner, was running in the beach or chase the last day. So we had to race from five pounds out of the handicap. He ran really well with that regard. Like he's well held by Shambard that day. But kind of banking that he might just enjoy the extra few cur- furlongs here um, and he's back he's five pounds lower essentially now so I thought he was okay and I thought Credo was another one just to mention at a decent price uh, running just really consistently so far uh, this mare for Anthony Honeyball uh, third into Tommy Whittle last time I just think that's good solid form and heavy ground which is obviously what you need for this uh, for this classic chase it, it always takes a dour stare to win I just thought those two were a little bit overpriced in what, albeit what is a really really competitive uh, race so I could see the ball with them running well 
And David, I know how much you love these big handicaps each and every weekend. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure you've put a bit of thought, and uh, you have uh, something nice for us at a good price in here. Well, Dave, I I, I hope I do anyway. Um, I'm going back to this card 12 months ago, and the novice chase on the card, uh, the 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 Hampton novices chase three miles, and Gally de la Toe was was pretty much breathtaking in the race last year. In that race last year, she beat Captain Unknown, a uh, complete unknown. Sorry, by by a you know, 13 or 14 lengths, absolutely bolted up. And do you know that day, I just wondered if Dan Skelton had in the back of his mind, we'll be back here in 12 months' time for the big one, for, for this classic chase. Because I think Warwick is definitely a track that she needs. I think she likes those, you know, five jumps in a row. I think she's better going left-handed than she is right-handed, and she needs real deep ground. So you're kind of, everything she wants in a race, she's going to get here. And uh, I think the handicapper has been really, really kind with her here because she was beaten by Pink Legend in that list at Mayor's Chase at Newbury. And he's dropped her three pound. Like she was a rock solid kind of 145 rated performer who ran quite reasonably well, I thought, in the Brown Advisory at Cheltenham behind a real whacker. Like she finished fifth that day. I thought it was a decent run. He's dropped her from 145 to 142. And Dan has pulled out the cheek pieces, so he has. He's pulled out the cheek piece for Galli de Lato. And I don't know if you remember, he had a horse called Captain Chaos who ran in this race in 2020, who tried to make all and just bumped into a really well handicapped horse in, in Kimberley Candy. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Galli de Lato tried something similar here and just attacked from the front and, and took plenty of horses out of their comfort zone. I think she's the class horse in the race, to be honest with you. And you look through and you say, oh, stay in handicap chase, a horse with a lot of weight. Go back through the last decade, Dave. I will do it. 11 stone 10 last year. Eclair yeah. Surf, 11 stone 3 in 2022. Kimberly Can Can Candy, who I spoke about, 11 stone 4 in 2020. 11 stone 2 Milan's Bar in 2018. 11 stone 7 Shotgun Paddy in 2014. So this has been a race where the classier horses have dominated in the last decade. And I think that is going to be the case here. I am very much with Galia de la Tau. Yeah, and I suppose, Ronan, we kind of see that, you know, each and every weekend, you know, in the big handicaps over maybe the last while. That, Like what David has just said, the classier horses with the bigger weights are coming out on top because at the end of the day, maybe they're the better horses. Although, look, we all know the exceptions of the odd horse laid out in a nice weight for these handicaps. But overall, the, 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 the runners in these big handicaps off uh, the heavier weights have done very well. Absolutely. I mean, weight is, it's all relative, I guess. Um, some punters look at weight and think, oh, God, that's at least going to have to haul that around uh, a, a long distance and think, oh, that's not for me. But it's all relative to class. You know, that's why that's the whole handicapping system, isn't it? So I think we were talking here on um, going into the Welsh National. I had no problem uh, stressing I will do it for that. Now, obviously, he didn't win on the day, but he ran fine race again. And it's, it's all that, like, like they've gone through the... the um, the horses here who've raced off big weights and the other ones are just looking down the list of winners that there obviously have been horses that won off low weights as well but it's all relative to your mark and how good you are so I wouldn't let like a, a big weight put anyone off especially uh, the classier types of horses are the didn't put my wife off anyway big weight didn't put Eve off let me tell you I was, just going, I was just going to say I've carried top weight in a few things, but I've never managed to win anything. And I've always been second to the ball when I used to be playing hurling in football. So, but that's for another day. I'm now in the retired paddock, so it really doesn't matter about uh, my performance anymore on that. Right, let's move on to race number three, David. And we'll come to you first in this because it's the Dan Moore, uh, Dan Moore Memorial Handicap Chase, the grade three at Fairy House and uh, due off at 157 on Saturday. Yeah, some bag of tricks in this, let me tell you. We've got all sorts of everything. You've got, let's be clear about it, who we thought was a three-mile chaser. And turns out he's probably doesn't quite see out a strongly run two and a half miles we've seen in the Drimmore. He's a class act in the race. Uh, runs the novice run here off mark 150. Then you've got the likes of Fighting Fifth, who's been prolific already this season. Uncle Phil is in there for Willie Mullins, the choice of Paul Town. And you've got Chavez, who's obviously won plenty of races. And then you've got my fancy in the race. I fancy Whiskey Welt for, for Terence O'Brien. I think Darrow, Darrow Keith could be the key here. Whiskey Welt is obviously not entirely straightforward. He's a bit of a tearaway. I think he would have won over hurdles last time at, at Thurlis. Now, he's run off 113, which is £13 below his, his chase mark. He was still a length in front of the second last. And I thought John Shinnick hadn't asked him for everything, to be honest with you. Now, he was entitled to win it, given he was running off mark 113 and, and John Shinnick was taking off £7. I thought he did too much too soon at the at the Winter Festival at Fairy House over this course and distance. 
Um, I just thought he ran away a bit on, on Mike, Mike O'Connor that day. But you just go back to the Easter Festival at Fairy House, uh, the Boyle Sports sponsored uh, Easter Festival, should I say, at Fairy House. Um, and that day against Dino Blue, like to be running against Dino Blue, and I think personally that Whiskey Welt would have fended off Dino Blue after the last. He was still a length and length or length or two up at the last when, when he came down. And that was off mark of 124. He's only two pounds higher now. Had he won that day, you'd imagine he would have went up hugely in the handicap. I think Fairy House is a track that suits him. And I think Dara O'Keefe taking over. I think Dara is the ideal man for a horse like this. And um, if he gets Whiskey Wells out there jumping, doesn't perhaps attack as much as been the case on his last visit to Fairy House. I think Whiskey Welt is really dangerous off mark of 127. So Whiskey Welt for me in the Dan Moore. And Ronan, what, what do you make of this one? I, I think it's a real nice race on Saturday. Uh, it's a real nice race, yeah. And I um, I just think the, 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 this race, uh, the, I think we talked about it before the the, uh, the big winter festival at Fairy House. Um, the, the easy fix handicap chase that's on that card, it's often a great pointer to this race. Like loads of horses have... Um, have done boat races. Obviously, it makes sense. There, there's enough gap between the races. Um, this one's obviously a lot more worth a lot more money. So you often get horses running in that first race, and and, and they're, um, you know, perhaps having their first run of the season, and, and they come back here and win well. But a lot of them have done the double as well. Um, I'm just looking back through the winners, like uh, Don Vegan did the double, Nerly Namid, uh, Duke of the Tie, uh, Don Vegan, I think. Uh, I think won the earlier race as well, the Easy Fix race. So my point being is that. Fighting fit was the angle uh, here because the Solness, who won that uh, easy fix race, isn't running. And, and Fighting Fit was second to him. And the Solness was probably well handicapped, won well on the day. But Fighting Fit ran well and it was his first run in a, in a while. So I think um, with that course know-how, he's proven over the course and distance. Um, I thought he was a bit over, overpriced at her, like what I'm seeing now here now, around 6-1. to one. Um and let's be clear about it. I do like him coming back down a trip. I don't know. It's hard to make of what he did in the Drim more. He just seemed to cut out there, uh, having traveled well into the straight. So the jury is, is out a bit to, to, to what, it, what he actually needs, what sort of trip. Because uh, he was so impressive, obviously, at Cork before that, basically won on the bridle. Uh, so it's hard to really be definitive about that run in the Drim more, what actually went on there. Uh, so with that question mark hanging over him, I thought fighting fit was probably the most solid here. Uh, I I'd suggest it's a positive as well for DJ's uh, selection there, Whiskey Well, because he ran, obviously, in the Easy Fix race and, and, and might be better off coming back here now uh, and was going well the last day over hurdles when he fell. So uh, Sam Raw, as well as a horse I've always thought potentially could be um, well handicapped. I thought he might be a Ryanair chase type horse this season, but uh, haven't gone that way yet. And he's been out class at grade one level. But I was wonder back in a handicap, would he be OK? Um, but I just thought fighting fit might be the one that ends up shading favoritism here, and and our price around six to one now I thought was uh, more than enough value. Yeah, and I thought Sandra it was an interesting runner. If uh, you know re recapturing any bit of the form, right? That's three of the five races that we're going to look at on the show this week for you. Don't forget to uh, like, subscribe to the channel, and of course enter your five cast uh, selections as well. And next week. Watch out for a very, very special prize that we've got to give away. And a little bit of a hint for you. Jack Cantillon of Syndicate.Racing will be joining us on the show. So that's all I can say for now. But there's a very, very special prize coming. Right, we're going to take an ad break. And right after this, we're going to have a word with Henry Beebe of Goffs. And as we get ever closer to the Tiestes Chase, of course, down at Gorham Park in uh, the 25th of January, of course. And uh, looking forward to a cracking day. That's all to come right after these. Gorn Park Racecourse, the premier racetrack in the southeast of Ireland, is located on the outskirts of Kilkenny City. Gorn is your number one choice for corporate days out, stag and hint party events, and an overall great local racing experience. Known as the race that stops the county, the famous Goffs Thiestes Chase 2024 takes place on Thursday, the 25th of January. And the finish of the Goffs Thiestes, invitation only, and Ruby Walsh on the near side for Willie Mullins, seventh win of the race. Invitation only has paid now for this open. With packed crowds expected once again this January, you can book your early bird tickets online today. Visit gorenpark.ie online, click the link in the champ.ie podcast video description, or scan the QR code on screen to purchase right now. Eddie and the team look forward to welcoming you all to Gorham Park Racecourse this winter. Justified. 
Yes, uh, welcome back uh, to Champ Tarai, this week's show, of course, episode 17, and we are delighted uh, to be joined by Henry Beebe of uh, Goffs. Henry, it's wonderful to have you on the podcast, delighted to have you, and I suppose we're going to start off by you giving us an insight with your involvement, of course, in the sponsorship of the Goffs, uh, Goffs uh, Taestes, and of course it doesn't stop there because uh, Goffs are such a, a massive sponsor of the National Hunt Racing throughout the year. Well, yeah, we 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 make our living out of racing, out of bloodstock. So we have to we have to put back. We're proud to be sponsors of the, of the Goths the ISTs. This is our thirteenth year. Uh, we've just renewed for another four years, and it's it's an, it's always an exciting day. It's always an enjoyable day. The race that stops a county, as the advert just said, it's wonderful that it remains midweek. People take time off. There's always a huge crowd there. It's a great race. Obviously, William Mullins going for his tenth. Uh, Diocese having one with carefully selected last year. So it's a great day. We also then sponsor the, the Irish Arkle at the Dublin Racing Festival. We have a hundred thousand euro bumper at the Punchestown Festival, the Goss Defender bumper that's link, linked to our Arkle sale. And we sponsor a number of point to points throughout the year. So we and we also support the owners and trainers lounge at uh, Punchestown and NACE, um, uh, National Hunt Wise. But we sponsor on the flat as well. But the diocese really is a highlight. And I'm not just saying that because that's what we're talking about. Goran Park is unique. Goran, the Goran team, Eddie and his team are unique. And every race course in the country, in the world, could learn from the way they look after sponsors, people that go racing and make it a superb day. So I can't wait for it. It's always a highlight. It really is always a great highlight. It's going to be a fantastic uh, day and a great race once again this year. Um, from over the last number of years, any particular winner that has stood out for you that, you know, has been a special winner of the race? And I know everyone that goes on to win a big race like this is a special winner, but anyone in particular that stands out for you? Well, I think Hedge Hunter was one that everyone talked about because it went on to, to Grand National Glory. So, but you look back over the years, I mean, you look you look at the role of honour. It's headed, of course, by the greatest of all time, by, by Arkel, who incidentally was a golf graduate, obviously a long time before I was involved. But it, it's a race that throws up a lot of very good horses every year. It's always very competitive. I mean, I couldn't tip rubbish. Last time I ticked a winner, I had black hair. Um, so I'm not going to tell you what I think will win or what, <laughs> what might win or what could win because it only upset everybody. So I will stand there. I'm not a punter either. I, I am always heavily biased. I follow the horses that have been sold by Goffs uh, more intently than any horse that might carry my couple of euros. So it's just, but it's the event, it's the day, it's the occasion, and it's the assignment of the whole thing that is just so good about Goffs Diestes Day. Yeah, it really is. And it's going to be another uh, spectacular day with Eddie and his team on the 25th of January. Um, I've often been intrigued, you know, I've been at the the sales just as a spectator, pop in and, and, and see everything goes on. But I, I've often wondered, what does it take to put a catalogue of horses of the quality? And more importantly, what's the work that goes on behind the scene in making a sale so successful at Goffs? Well, if you take the Arkel sale, um, which is our, our, our leading national hunt sale, it's now the market leading national hunt sale in the country, has the biggest share of, of, of top class three-year-old stores every year, had the highest clearance rate, the highest median last year. The average is about 52,000 euro. The top price is 250. That all starts right about now. That as, soon as, as soon as the new year comes, we send out marketing documentation to potential vendors. And then we have a, a, an outstanding team Jerry Hogan, Neil Walsh, Peter Maloney, Kevin Ross, Harry Fowler, and the rest of our team, who then visit all the breeders and go to the farms and chat to the, the owners and the breeders and the vendors of these horses and try and persuade them to send, uh, if not all their best, at least a good share, uh, uh, the, the majority or a good share of their best uh, to the Arkle sale. We put the catalogue together over the next few months. By, by Cheltenham time, we finished our inspections. We then produced the catalogue around Punchestown. Uh, and then we promote the sale leading up to, to the three days in June. And we have a, a wide network of agents and a, a, a purchaser attraction team. We work with Irish Thoroughbred Marketing. We travel around everywhere for the Arkle sale, Britain and Ireland, really a little bit in France. A few American buyers come uh, to promote the sale uh, every year. So 
that that's what goes into an arkel cell when you get to the yearling cell we start in the spring we go onto the farms we do all the same work there select the horses with the breeders with the vendors we then promote the sale all over the world and we have a network of international agents uh, all over the world australia china um, uh, japan united states across europe to bring people here and we always say that goffs is the gateway to the world for irish breeders and so what we we are charged with doing is delivering for irish breeders there are alternatives of course um, so we have to do we have to work harder uh, go further and do more to deliver for those for those uh, vendors who give us they place enormous trust in us really because you know when the horse is in the sales ring it might be there for two two and a half minutes and that could make a difference to somebody's entire year so we 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 feel that that trust and we we do our best to repay it you've spoken about arkel briefly and you know being a massive part of the you know the history of goffs and everything but there's been many many more great superstars that have come through the ring as well at goffs Oh, yeah, there are. The list the list goes on and on. Red Rum's another icon who passed through the, the sales ring at Goss. More recently, Altio, who was, went so long undefeated for Nicky Henderson, was a graduate of the sale. And even more recently, Honeysuckle. So, you know, you've got horses like that. This season, recent grade one winners, you've got uh, you've got Stage Star, Caldwell Potter, Captain Teague, the real whacker, to name just a few. But, the, you know, the list goes on and on. It's a, it's a wonderful roll of honour. Uh, it's something that makes us very proud. And when I'm standing at Punchestown or at Fairy House or at Cheltenham or at Aintree or anywhere else, Newbury, wherever else I might go, you know, the thrill we get, we call them our horses. They're nothing to do with us, really. Um, you know, they walk through our sales ring for a couple of minutes. They're on our sales grounds for two or three days. But once they've been under the Goss hammer, once we've auctioned them, we view them as our horses. And I get as excited as the owners do when I see a Goss graduate win a big race, a little race, any race. That's that's what we're all about. We're all about selling winners at the top of the tree and all about quality racehorses. I was just going to say that to you, like from your point of view, working with Goffs and, you know, seeing, I suppose sometimes you don't know what you're seeing in front of you in the sales ring. You know, it could be the next champion hurdle winner, the next Gold Cup winner, the next Grand National winner. But when they go on, like what you've just said, to achieve great things, that must give you and the team at Goffs such great satisfaction. Oh, yeah, it's it's what it's all about, because we could sell horses for lots of money. If they're no good, then the people won't come back. So the reason a person would come back to Goffs to buy a horse is because they've bought a good horse before and because we've catalogued more potential. So horse, sales like the Arkle sale and the Orby sale are all about potential. They're all unraced. The store, three-year-old stores, the Arkle sale, the Yearlings and the Orby sale, they're all unraced. It's all about potential. But the excitement we get, it is genuine. Goose pimples we get. And when we see... The honeysuckles, the arkles, the altios, whatever, whatever the other horse is, the red rums, winning down the years. You know, I read that the real whacker, they think he's got a proper chance in the Gold Cup. I mean, I, I will be jumping up and down on the lawn at Cheltenham if he happened to be there or thereabouts uh, when it, when we, when they're galloping up the hill. So it's it's very exciting, and I I, I just love it. I've never done it. I haven't done anything else. I'm 41 years into this auctioneering career, and. I still love it. I still get excited. I still get excited by selling horses well uh, and exceeding expectations because when it's the vendors, it's all about getting a little bit more than they want. So it's not just about selling horses for hundreds of thousands. It's about if a guy wants five grand, you get him eight grand. If a guy wants 100 grand, you get him 120. And if a guy wants 500,000, you get him 750, whatever it may be. So that's the thrill for us. And then seeing those horses win on the track. And I suppose before we we, we finish up, you know, you've you've mentioned about the way Irish breeding has been so successful over the years and it continues to to do so. And I suppose the strength of that can be seen with the graduation from there into the point to point scene as well, which is a huge stepping stone to seeing and to developing these stars for the future. Yeah, I mean, John Bond and Constitution Hill, two of the best horses in training at the moment, are graduates of of golf sales and and i i was the auctioneer for john bond he'd won once in a point to point uh, before jp mcmanus bought him for five hundred and seventy thousand, uh, and he's gone on to be a superstar so it's, it's wonderful to see you know but we're world champions in ireland we, we, we are we are the best in the world and it's it's the one thing well it's it's one thing anyway that we can travel around the world uh and we we use phrases like the spiritual home of the thoroughbred you know we have Willie Mullins and Gordon Elliott and, and Aidan O'Brien and, and all the other great trainers we have in this country. And so we're blessed in that respect. And it's what is so exciting when you see 
the home team winning at home, but also winning abroad. So when you see Cheltenham being dominated by Irish horses and you see the Epsom Derby being dominated by Irish horses and you see the Melbourne Cup being won, the Breeders' Cup, that makes us very proud. And it makes our job easier to be able to travel around the world and say, come to Ireland because we've got what you want. Well, I think on that note, we're going to leave it there. We're going to look forward to seeing you on the day, on uh, Tiesta's day down in Gorham Park. It's going to be a magnificent day. I've no doubt about that. And uh, just like to wish you and all the team at Goffs the very, very best to look with the sponsorship of the Tiestas and throughout the remainder of 2024 and in the sales ring as well. Hopefully there's some future superstars to go through. Well, thank you very much. We can't wait for Tiestas day. It's a true highlight. We always say when, when the new year comes, it's the first thing in our calendar. We're looking forward to Tiestes Day and we can't wait. Thank you very much, Henry, for joining us. That was uh, Henry Beebe there. And uh, Henry, of course, we will see him on uh, the day at uh, the Tiestes Day down in uh, Goran Park with Eddie and the team, where we'll be doing a live, of course, Champ.ie preview. Uh, don't forget, if you are going along, to come over and say hello to us on the day. Right, what have we got next on the show? Well, Derek Fox might be on the sideline list at the moment with a little injury. He'll hope to be back very soon. And earlier this week, Barry Doyle caught up with Derek Fox to get his thoughts on some of his big chances for the year ahead. Correct, Rambler. We might as well come on to him because uh, he's a dual Cheltenham Festival winner. He rode him with supreme confidence on both occasions. He's a horse that likes to come from behind. Is he tricky sort of a character? There were two massive days for you. Yeah, that's that, 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 that's true. Um, he, he uh, Korak Rambler has been a, a superstar, really. He's um, he's uh, you know, he, he, just from the first day I've ever ridden him, he, he, he won his maiden hurdle nicely, and and he just went on and kept. Pro- he's one of those horses who just keeps progressing and progressing. He's never going to go out and win by twenty lengths any day, and he never has, even in his maidens and his novices. But uh, he um, you know, he. He, he's massive talent, and uh, yeah, he, he 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 gets a wee bit lonely when he when he gets to the front. But you know, he's a massive amount of ability, and um, you know, he's just been he's just, he's just been a great horse to've been associated with. And uh, you no, know, hopefully he's he's still there and he's st- still um in good order, and hopefully the, there could be more to come from him. He seems to be a horse that has come forward with each of his runs each season, and we've seen the best of him in the spring. Do you think that this year? It's going to be the, the same story with him. Yeah, exactly. He um he didn't have a great run first time out last year or this year, uh, to be honest. But he, I was very happy with him in the Bedford Chase at Haydock, and uh, t- he 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 finished. He, he, I thought I thought for his first time in a Grade One in Open Company, he 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 definitely um you know he showed he, he had he had he had he had the right to be there, and um I think he. As you say, he, he he does seem to come to his very best into the spring, and 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 hopefully he could have improved on from Haydock to Cheltenham. Now I don't think he's gonna run. He won't run between now and Cheltenham, and hopefully come Cheltenham time he'll be even more wound up. And and uh, yeah, really looking forward to him. As the year goes on, the, the longer he's in training, you know. So as I say, just some horses could be when they get the summer grass can be. Some of them come in, and they, they could come to hand very fast. But on the other hand, then some horses just can take a run or two. And uh, he doesn't get a lot of racing either. So it, it's you know it's, he, he he only had a few runs last year, and he's only gonna he's only had two runs this year. And then you know he's gonna have a long gap between his last run and his next run. It's gonna be a big gap as well. So um, the fact that he's lightly raced is is, is probably. Do you think he can be a dark horse in a in a Cheltenham Gold Cup, considering his uh, festival record? Listen, yeah, I, I I definitely think he can. I think his form of his last of the ultimate handicap chase last year is, is with, with faster slow has, has come out and you know showed some good, very good form since and uh, ties in with the Gold Cup winner and 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 runner up. So um. I definitely think he'll be he'll be doing his best work at the end, and uh, I know he's going to stay every inch of the trip. So, so that you know, I think um, I think whatever's on front won't won't want to see see him coming 
at them after the second last or the last later on anyway i think i think um i think you know he's he, he's definitely a horse that um you know as a as a chance of um as a chance of running a big race uh you, you know he's um you know you always hear about you know good horses in the air and stuff that that they're the they're the yard favorite and stuff but he def, definitely is with all the staff they all adore him you know he, but he is just the most likable horse and uh he's a great nature he's he, he, he's an absolute pet so um you know it just makes everything more enjoyable with him that that he that he is such a likable horse and uh you know very easy to work with and you know if, if if you know there's days there in the summer there could be open days and there could be a hundred people looking to get a picture taken with him and he'll stand there for half an hour or an hour and just you know nothing phases him you know so um you know he's the most lovable horse you'd ever work with so so it makes it even even more special but uh no definitely um definitely a very talented horse as well and uh you know sometimes i think we we're so used to him around the yard and he's such, such an easy going horse you forget how good a horse he is but uh you know he, de- he definitely has a massive amount of ability and um you know a horse that that, that is every, every right to have a go on a gold cup yeah speaking about yard favorites derek a high senior is giving you some big big days in the saddle as well I suppose, how disappointed have you been with him so far this season and what he's shown on the track this year? Yeah, High Senor has been a, a, a marvellous horse for me as well. And uh, he, he's, he's a very, very classy horse um, on his day when, 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 when he puts it all together. He's been a bit disappointing the first two runs um, haven't been great this year. But I think there's little reasons behind it, you know. Just there's little things, little niggles here and there that just just might mightn't have, um, you know, that you could hopefully put a line through his runs, and and that uh, we haven't seen the best of him in them two runs. So, uh, you know, he's back. He's back in a better way of going now, and um, you know, I I I I um I I think. Uh, Again, coming in, coming into later on in the year, you, you'll see the best of him as well into the spring. So you see his entries in the in the likes of the stairs hurdle, obviously the right air chase and the gold cup. Do you think there's any chance we could see him back over hurdles this season? Uh, I wouldn't think so. Uh, I don't think he'll go back over hurdles. I wouldn't like to see him go back over hurdles this year. Uh, I think he. He, he is a chaser. He he did jump well at Newbury the last day, although he didn't run great. But uh, I didn't feel like it was his jumping that let him down. You know, he he was he he, he pulled up four four out, but up till then he he, he he jumped as good as he ever did. And uh, you know, I don't think it's the the his jumping is the problem with him. So um, no, I think uh, he definitely I think he'll definitely stay over fences and um. As far as I know, he'll go on the Cotswold chase at the end of the month at Cheltenham. But uh, unfortunately, now um, I'm off injured. But um, I I think that's where he's going to have his next run. And then, yeah, it just depends where he goes then and after that. Yeah, speaking of uh, staying chasers and uh, I suppose young, youngsters that might take up the baton from the likes of Cora Grambler. And uh, obviously a high senior in future years. Apple's away. I mean, she looks very good, Derek. And it looks to be one of the uh, up-and-coming youngsters in the air. Tell us about her. Yeah, Apple away. Uh, she, she, she's a very special mare. She, um, she's um, she, she's a real wee character as well. I, I do write her out a good bit when I'm, when I'm in, in the air, obviously. You know, if I'm not away racing, whatever. If I'm there, I normally have sitting her a nice bit as well. But uh, she, she's she's took the fences really well. Um, she did a great, nice run first day out at Haydock over fences. Uh, over two and a half, and then she 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 went to Leicester, and uh, she couldn't have been any more impressive. And um, no, she just it's just it's just again she's just very you know straightforward mare that just. Whatever you ask her to do, she 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 just does her very best to 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 please. And um, 
you know, she, 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 for, she just, she's a nice size Philly mare, but she's, you know, she's not a big massive scopey animal either. So she, she, um, she, she, she but she's very brave and she's taken the defenses beautifully. So, um, she's definitely one that, you know, as a novice, you could, could, couldn't be any happier with. So, um, no, I'm really looking forward to her as well. And she's entered up obviously in Warwick at the weekend. Are you uh, expecting a bold show? Listen, she couldn't have been any more impressive the last day. So, um, exactly, I, uh, you know, she, 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 she'd be the one to beat anyway. And uh, very unfortunately, I won't be able to uh, be on her this time. But um, you know, um, that's just how it goes. And uh, no, I, I um. I imagine she 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 she'll um, take all the beating. I, I suppose you have to dream in this sport. Do you think she could be one potentially for the likes of uh, uh, Brown Advisory? Obviously, I said you were in a crack with that before. Oh, exactly. Yeah, that, that you, you 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 know the sky's the limit for that for Apple really. Um, from what she's shown so far, she's a, you know, obviously she's a Grade One winner over hurdles and. Uh, you know, it's not to be taken lightly, and she, you know, she's a uh, she's just a, again she's a very a very classy filly mare, and 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 uh, definitely one to to be looking forward to. Trapean Law is a horse that so you've ridden in the past, Derek, as well, and he looks to be one on a real upward curve over fences. Yeah, well, I've just ridden him the once. Uh, First time out in the maiden hurdle, and uh, he finished second. But uh, again, he's been very, he's he's been very good over hurdles, and uh, he looks progressive again. He's taken offence as well, from what I've seen of him, and um, yeah, he's a, he's a horse. That, again, you wouldn't be surprised if he if he if he if he, if, he, if he goes all the way. He's he's a very exciting horse. I wanted to ask you about a horse that um, was, was, was quite impressive um, on his first start up at air. And I know you didn't ride him on that occasion. Stephen McQueen was on board. Um, the horse is called Primos. Obviously, you rode him in the, in, in the grade two at Haydock. Are you slightly disappointed how he performed? Could there be much more to come from him, do you think, maybe in handicaps this year? Yeah, he, he, he won very well, Stephen Rodham on that day. I was uh I was actually at Weatherby riding the Heisen York um the same day, but uh, I think with Primos he's a very classy horse. He's a beautiful looking horse, a big scopey horse, he's he, a, a big, big unit. Uh he always works very well at home. So we we're always probably hopefully he'd go out and win his maiden well. And I just think the second day at Haydock, the ground was very holding for him. Although he's a big horse, he likes good ground, or nice ground. Uh, he, 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 he does that freestyle of running where he runs off the front and loves the ball away. And I just don't feel like, you know, probably a wee bit of maturity. And, and he just ran with, with on his nerves a little bit the second day at Haydock. And, and I think you know the the ground the ground was just a bit holding on the day and and he just didn't see it out. He led the he, he jumped great and led them into the straight, but just lay it on. He 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 just he just um you know he's probably just done a wee bit too much early on and not, and not relaxed into the race well enough. But uh, I definitely feel into the spring he on, on on better ground back on better ground he 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 um he is a very talented horse as well. And finally, Derek, for Champion the followers uh, who are listening. And uh, before we do let you go, is there any younger horse, maybe one that we haven't mentioned, that you like the look of, that might be worth uh, following their career? So, there's a um, a lovely horse I won on the other day um, at Ear called Esprit de Potier. And again, he's only turned five. And uh, he's a he's won two bumpers and he was sixth in the entry bumper uh, in the race after the Grand National last year. And uh, he's taken a couple of runs over hurdles. He was second in his first two hurdle runs, where he just he just um 
you know, just needed the experience a wee bit. Uh, having been a good bumper horse, he just just took a run or two to get get the hang of the hurdles. But um, he couldn't have jumped any better. He jumped as good as any horse could have um, on the at the air the last day on the second of January. And he's one I think could 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 be very exciting and worth following when when um, for, for, for towards towards the end of the season. I'll tell yes. you something. What a voice Henry Beebe has! If you could bottle that voice, I'm just <laughs> I'm just thinking of the the champ listeners here. Like, imagine going from the soothing tones of Henry Beebe to the thick, horrible Navin accent of David Jennings. It's like chalk and cheese. <laughs> ah, you've been very hard on yourself. We think you have an absolutely a, a beautiful voice. You wouldn't be on the show otherwise. We 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 gave uh, we tried five other guests this week. They all refused. So you, you beautiful were... elbows. That's about it. <laughs> I uh, know. Right, guys, let's move on because we've two more races to look forward to. And uh, two of those are coming at Kempton on Saturday. Firstly, I want to look ahead to the uh, Grade 2 Silviaco Conti uh, uh, Grade 2 contest. Firstly, uh, David, I'll come to you on this. What do you like in this 205 at Kempton on Saturday? Uh, it's now actually the 207, would you believe? They put it back two minutes, I think, for, for TV. But uh, Look, my my weekend and potentially my season will revolve around 207 at Kempton on Saturday because I have a theory here and I suppose up in the anti-viewers and podcasts that I do will know my, my thoughts on this race because, um, look, I, I think Edward Stone has been crying out for a step up and trip for, for some time and uh, I think he's a big, big player in the Ryanair. And if I think he's a big, big player in the Ryanair, I think he has to be winning the Silva Niaco Conti chase. Um, I just go through this race and... I wasn't impressed with Pick Dory last time in the 1965 chase at Ascot. Look, Shishkin refused to, refused to race, but I thought his jumping was lethargic. And I thought turning in, Straw and Jack actually could beat him. And Harry Cobden said the same after the race. Straw and Jack next time was hammered out of sight in a three runner race, beating 40 lengths. So that form isn't worth, so, isn't worth nothing. So I, I, I'm not convinced by Pick Dory. Bambridge is having a, his first start since winning the Grade One at Aintree last season, and if they do get the rain at forecast at Kempton, that will obviously hinder his chances. And then you're kind of going, well, well, what are you left with then? Well, you're left with Not Till May, who obviously bumped into Stage Star in the in the Paddy Power Gold Cup at Cheltenham and r- ran a fine race and has form tied in with Stage Star from the festival and, and the ill fated Mighty Potter and stuff. And then you got Janadil. but I just keep coming back to Edward Stone and. According to Racing Post ratings, the second best performance of his entire career after his Tinker Creek win last season was in the Tinker Creek this season when he was second to John Bond. He was beaten two and three quarter lengths that day. He made one poor mistake, I thought, at one of the railway fences. But apart from that, I thought he actually ran really well. Uh, John Bond didn't hammer him by any stretch of the imagination. It was two and three quarter lengths in it at the line. And to me, it just screamed of Edward Stone, just needing a little bit further, just to get into that rhythm. And um, I think he's going to be too pacey for these, Dave. Uh, obviously, Bambridge is a big threat if the real Bambridge showed up. But if the ground does soft, then I do think he's will even run if the ground turns out to be really soft. I'm not sure. I think Edward Stone, no matter what the ground does, it won't matter to Edward Stone. And he was bitterly, bitterly disappointed. Like, he was 15 to for the champion chase last season. He was beaten. He was one of the first beaten in the race. He's beaten 64 lengths. But if you take that run out, if you actually just take out last year's champion chase run, and you look through his last three seasons, like he is as consistent as they come. And I think he's going to take the world to beat him here. I think he should be favoured. And I think Edward Stone will win. Well, if you had to go by the rumblings all the week leading up to the race, like the, the, there's some positive vibes floating around for, for Edward Stone. Are you in the Edward Stone camp, Ronan? Or are you going to go, go elsewhere in this one? I do like him, um, Dave. Like, like he's... Um... I do like the the, the 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 profile of a horse, like the, the top quality horse at two miles or indeed three miles coming back to this intermediate trip because I don't think the intermediate horses are often that good. They're like caught between two sto- stools and, and the horses that come up or come down the trip can often outclass them. And that would obviously be the case if Edward Stone was to come here. He just has a, lo- looks to me like he might have a bit more class for pick or he, but he does have to prove he can stay. And uh, until they actually do it, you just have that question mark um, against them. I suppose a way in, a way around it is to back him for the Ryanair now before the race. If you think, um, if you think he does, because he probably would shorten up a lot if he, if he did get the business done here. Banbridge is interesting, of course he is, but 
the soft ground, I think the ground's only going to get softer. There's 21 mils for Kempton on Friday. Um, I'm sure we'll turn the ground pretty testing. And they've just basically been waiting for soft for a, a decent surface all season. So I don't see why um, they they go and run them now. If the ground did indeed turn soft, they'd probably just wait um, you know, for something else down the line. I think that the Kinlock Bray could be an option or, or even go to the Dublin Racing Festival, go for that handicap, the two-mile five there. Um that said, I'm, I, I did like him last season. I backed him for the Turners. I was good that he didn't run, and the ground actually turned out all right. I think he would have had a big chance there. But the form of his entry win, it's not amazing. Like We beat the aforementioned Sam Rod there. Um, I can't even remember what was third in the race. It wasn't a, it wasn't an amazing race at all, and, and he just about got home. Um, so I think he just had to step up to this level. And I wouldn't be so down on Pick Doherty like DJ is. Um, I take it that he looked a bit lethargic at Ascot, but the race was a bit of a non-event after Shishkin didn't start and he did end up going and winning by 16 lengths. Like it's interesting, like for a horse that won the bet for hurdle, he beat 24 other runners there. All his wins over fences have come in like really small fields. Like he's kind of a bit of a flat track bully and he's a Kempton specialist. And I always like horses going that win at Kempton, going back to Kempton because it is that sort of unique track. It's flat. You need to travel really well. You need to jump really well. And, and I think he can do that here. I, he just about be my selection here, um, just with the question mark over Edward Stone staying. Uh, and I do, I just think he's a he's a good horse pick, or he, especially at this grade two sort of level. He's eight from 16, I think, over fence is a really good record. And as I said, two of those wins have come at Kempton, uh, including in this race last season. So he just about get the uh, get the nod from me. And David, just... Uh... You know, if if the way you're st- talking about Edward Stone, you expect him to win on Saturday, right? Before Saturday's race, let's say he goes on to win impressively. Where will he go in Cheltenham? I think you've just muted yourself there, Dave, have you? Not sure. I did. I did indeed. Oh, yeah, I did. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no. that's, that's the dream, Dave. The dream is that he wins this race and then he's second favourite for the Ryanair behind Alaho because I've tipped him up in the ante of 14 to 1 for the Ryanair chase. Look, I just think with Edward Stone, early on in his career, if you look through even his breeding and everything, he's bred to get a lot further than two miles. Um, I think early on in his career, he was so keen early on in his races that they said, we have to run him over two miles. But now he's far more laid back. You can put him where you want in a race. And I think he's only actually ran over two and a half miles once, which was in a handicap herd at Aintree a couple of seasons ago. I think he's far more relaxed now. I, I'm i not in the least bit worried. I know until they try it, you never know. I'm not in the least bit worried about the trip. I think he'll stay. And I think the new course at Cheltenham is made for him in the Ryanair. So, look, these things never turn out the way you want. And it's likely that this will just be another uh, example of that and that he'll be stuffed on Saturday and won't even run in the Ryanair. But my dream is for him to win this impressively, be 7-2 for the Ryanair and for him to win the Ryanair. Yeah, and have a lovely long wait into Cheltenham then. That's what it's all about, isn't it? That was an excitement. Right, don't forget, if you haven't done so, into your five cast selections. Look at those races on screens again. And now it's time for us to look ahead to our final race of the five. And that is, of course, the two-mile five Lanzarote um, hurdle uh, this, this week. And it's at Kempton, and it's going to be another great race. Ronan, firstly to you on this one, what do you like? Uh, excellent race again really competitive um, and no surprise to see a Henderson horse and a Nichols horse at the top of the markets um, they have eight wins between them since 2003 so that's eight wins in the last um, 19 odd renewals so um, and both of these have a nice profile don't they and Paul's Trois and I thought I'd backed him in the uh, uh, the, the, the old what was the old Ladbrook is the Betfair exchange hurdle now at um, Ascot just before Christmas thought he might have been the best horse in the race and she had just got first run on him um, <clears throat> interesting now coming up the trip and San and Gino as well lovely profile as well coming up to this sort of trip um, I just thought that the one that was interesting or I thought was a little bit overpriced is the other Henderson horse here King Alexander really liked the way he did it at Exeter um, he's a six-year-old. Six-year-old actually have a kind of quirky, unique record in this race um, down the years. And uh, he just strikes me as one that uh, nice and unexposed, did it really nicely there first time out. He's probably a bit underrated here because he, he seems like he's a Nicky Henderson second string. But I, I often like that as an angle. I think people can get too caught up on uh, what appears to be the first string and, and can often be overbet. And, and King Alexander, I thought there was a lot to like about the way he did it. He basically won on the bridle at Exeter. He strikes me as one that will uh, enjoy the step up and trip. And uh, I think at around the 9 to 1 mark, I thought he'd do for me, no problem. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good race. David, what, uh, what stands out for you in the Lanzarote? 
Okay, I'm going to give you one absolutely stupid one and one that I think will be hard to beat, okay? The stupid one, first of all, okay, is Teddy Blue, okay? Teddy Blue is just, people will be laughing now listening to this, but I think with Teddy Blue, he's got so much ability, but he's just an absolute rogue, so he is. But I, I think stepping up and trip, he's just been kind of, how would you put it? He's been, he's, I don't know what way is the best to describe it, but he's been deflated, I suppose, the best way to describe it. He's been deflated, getting bullied in two mile races where the early part of the race he's not in his comfort zone and he's making mistakes and everything is going wrong okay i think that's what's happened to him this season and um, i thought he ran a cracker in the swinton with just beaten by black poppy last season i think stepping up to two mile five Kalen quinn taking off uh three pound off a you know a low mark now he's been dropping another two pound to 132 i think he's reasonably interesting i know that sounds stupid and he could just sulk again like he did at ascot but i just thought at ascot they, he just got ran off his feet, to be honest with you. I think this trip is going to suit. So at around 40 or 50 to 1, I could see Teddy Blue and first-time cheap pieces running well. As regards the most likely winner, at the top of the market, I think I think either Impostois or Sonagino would probably win it. And I keep changing my mind as the day goes by. But earlier on this morning, I had a proper look at this race. And I think the key thing here could be ground. If they do get all the rain that's forecast, I think you have to be with Sonagino. Because when you go through Sonagino's form, when there's real proper cut on the ground, like... He's a fair operator. Like he won on heavy ground at Altai, was really impressive under Kevin Nabe that day. He won at Aintree last time on absolutely bottomless ground at Aintree, and he bolted up, travelled really well off 137. He won on very soft ground in France again for uh, at Moulin, um, when 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 it was almost unraceable. And um, even when you go to his run in the Great Wood, where I actually thought he ran really well under Freddie Jingle that day. Um, he finished fourth. It was real soft ground that Sunday at Cheltenham. I thought he ran really well. So I think the ground is going to be the deciding factor here between the top two in the market. The softer it is, the more Sonagino comes into the reckon. And I think I would just about favour Sonagino the top two of the market. But it's a good race. And don't rule out Teddy Blue having a revival over this sort of trip. Yeah, and very interesting indeed. And uh, good luck with your five cast selections, of course, uh, out there. And of course, keep entering those because next week we've got a very, very nice prize to give away. And there, once again, the five races that you can get involved in in your five cast. Right, lads, just um, on uh, Constitution Hill, um, so much about this, you know, he's ran one race and likelihood he's going to go straight to Cheltenham. Um, it, 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 where do you sit on it, David? Like, Firstly, uh, with a horse, I'm just because look, he's a superstar. You know, I I, I was just uh, talking during the week about um, honeysuckle at her best. Henry de Bromhead, you know, brought her out. He, he raced her. Okay, she was beaten once in her career, but he raced her. He brought her out to the public. Um, Nikki Henderson and owner, right or wrong in your opinion? Um. Right or wrong? Sure, from a public perspective, obviously completely wrong, and we'd love to see uh, Constitution Hill as many times as we can. And it, like my editor Richard Forrester wrote a column in the Race and Post this week, and and his main point, which he pointed out, was like Constitution Hill is winning these races in second gear. To the to the naked eye, it looks like he's having really really easy races. Now we don't know behind the scenes if these races are taking much out of him, but it looks like he's strolling around these tracks in second gear, and yet we're only going to see him once before Cheltenham, but. Nicky Henderson, I, I feel he's a creature of habit, okay? And I'd say going into the season, he says, right, we're going to run the Fighting Fifth at Newcastle, we're going to run the Christmas Hurdle at Kempton, we're going to run the Champion Hurdle, and then we're going to go to Aintree or Punchestown. Probably Punchestown probably this year, because last year at Aintree, over two and a half miles, Constitution Hill wasn't at his best. So I'd say coming into this season, he said, right, we're going to have four runs. What can the public say about that? Four runs is perfectly respectable in a season. Then, obviously, we lost the original fighting fifth at Newcastle. And then he was kind of playing catch-up then, going, oh, will we run him in the rescheduled fighting fifth at Sand then? Oh, it's going to be bottomless. We're not going to run him there. And it was close enough to Christmas. So then he ran at Christmas, bowls up, and you say the international hurdle at Cheltenham has been rescheduled, and you say perfect race for him. But now he's saying to himself, well, last year he was so good in the champion hurdle, and we went from Christmas to the champion hurdle you know, do I do I really want to risk that peak performance in the champion hurdle by running him in the international? And he's saying no, because to him it doesn't make sense. Look, to the public, it doesn't make sense that he doesn't run as much as he can because he is a superstar. We want to see him. It looks like these races are not taking out anything out of him. But I think Henderson is saying to himself, those were my four targets at the start of the season. We've lost one because the fight in the fifth was lost. 
So let's just aim for the other three. Look, it's like it's bullshit, really. Me saying, you know, oh, he's the trainer, and and you know, he knows what's best for the horse. But look, that's that's kind of the way I feel about it, to be honest with you. I can understand the public outcry. I can understand Henderson. I'm sitting somewhere in the middle. I've splintered in my arse. I'm on the fence. I'd love to see him more. I'd love to see him more. That's that's the that's the long and the short of it, Dave. Broaden left or right at the fence or above on top of it. For oh, you. I'd be very anti this sort of thing. I think I think you're teeing me up there, to be honest. But I get really annoyed about it, to be honest. It's like here you have like a worldly horse, like literally once in a generation. So do big things with them. Don't play it safe all the time. And I just think that's what they're doing. Like it's easy to say if you were mine, which is obviously completely hypothetical, but you were, we're, we're all racing fans and we all have the right to opinion. No one, you know, like, and uh, I think the general opinion out there is this, that, that this is just really disappointing to look at. It's really cautious. It's really, you know, you have a once in a lifetime type of horse here, but you're just not running them enough. Like why wouldn't he run at the Dublin racing festival? That would be hugely exciting for everyone, arguably more exciting than Cheltenham than uh, the champion hurdle because he'd be coming over to Ireland, you know, he'd be coming into the backyard of state, man. Like, why, if you're, as an owner, as Michael Buckley, would he not want to do that? Like, why, why is the that flip side of that is, an option? The flip side of that, Ronan, is why doesn't R- Willie run state, man, or in Perry Pass in the, in the Christmas hurdle? Yeah, you can say that, but the, he's the champion constitution. Now. Why don't they campaign him like the champion? No, I, 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 I agree I, with I, you, but I'm, I'm just, I'm playing devil's advocate here. So he, like they can't, they have the races for him in Britain, and he's not even running them. So the chances of him coming to the Dublin Racing Festival are a million to one. If he's not going to run in the international hurdle, there's not a hope from running in the Irish Champion hurdle. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I, but that's the, I know that that's what you're trying to say. I'm just saying that's that makes what he's doing now what they're actually doing all the more embarrassing. I'm calling them for do to go the other way, and they're going the other way, the opposite to me completely. They're not even going to run in the international hurdle. Which would be, you know, at least he'd be tens on again, but we get to see him. It's it's a joy to see him. Like he, the way he hurdles, the way he goes through races, he looks like the Frankel of hurdles. And like, and and just to see him, which is probably going to be three times now. You saying four times is, would be acceptable. I think you need to see him at least five times a season, to be honest with you, and they'd be well able to do that. You know, if if it takes him that long um, to get ready, why don't they get him ready a bit earlier in the season? I, I just I find it really really frustrating. I have to say, and. Uh, I don't know. Look, there's no point arguing about it. I don't think uh, Nicky is uh, is going to listen to anyone or um, and, and and change his mind. You know, he's, there's been instances down down the years with Altior, etc., and uh, he's stuck to his guns. And look, of course, he has the the absolute right to that. He's the trainer and obviously the owner as well. But we have a right as well to be disappointed and express disappointment about it. And I think there's a generally strong view of that out there, and uh, it's just a pity. I do think it's a real pity because because. You know, horses are, are fragile, etc. He could get injured at any point, and then they'd be sorry they didn't run him, and uh, we'll be sorry we didn't see him. Yeah, but like, okay, it's, if both are valid points, right? But like, if we if we look at the superstars, uh, Constitution Hill, which he is, Galloping Deschamps is also a superstar. How many times will he run before the Gold Cup this season? Hmm. Yeah, is that a gonna... valid point, or yeah. is that is that a different point that I'm trying to make? Because it's Constitution Hill to gallop in the champ or to any uh, another. No, no, it's a, it's I'm just a, throwing a, it out there. To it's you a very valid say. point. Uh, gallop in the champs ran twice before winning the Gold Cup last year. The likelihood is he'll run three times this year because he probably will run the Irish Gold Cup because the Durkham was moved forward to facilitate the Savills Chase at, at Leverson over Christmas. So Willie is keen to kind of, I suppose, praise the program workers and let him run three times before Cheltenham. You look back to Album Photo, won the, the New Year's Day chase at Tremor twice the year before the years he won the Gold Cup. So I, I, I think with Constitution Hill it's slightly more frustrating because it looks like he's absolutely cantering through his races. It looks like he probably will end up being the best horse, the best jumps horse we're ever likely to see, certainly the best hurdler. So when you're Better being deprived Ah, yeah, I think he'll end up being better. Yeah, Brack. yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's got to run. He's got to run. He's got to run. Yeah, and yeah. As as like people point out, you know, people will say, uh, you know, he hasn't won three champion hurdles like Isterbrack has. But uh, when you only run, when you only ran him one champion hurdle, it's hard to, to win three. Like, do you know? Would you say just on that? We're going. We're not going to go on too long. But just this question. Is the Brett Constitution Hill? I know you're comparing different horses from different eras, but 
uh, would the would it be fair to say that Constitution Hill has lesser of an opposition than Isterbrack ever had, David, or more? What, what what way would you see it? It's just the, the, it's that discussion and love about the great horses in our generation. Yeah, well, as regards, uh, I suppose opposition, you could point to Moscow Flyer, obviously that that Isterbrack ran against, who was probably one of the better horses he ran against. But then you look to his champion hurdles, and you're kind of going Blue Royal Theatre World finished second in a couple of them. Um, Hurla Loa was in there. I know Hurla Loa won a Supreme, went on to win a champion hurdle. Um, I would say Stateman would absolutely eat the horses that is to Brack beat in his champion hurdles. It's just a personal opinion. I think Stateman, Stateman is is better, far better, in fact, to what is to Brack was beaten in his champion hurdles. To me, Dave, and, and I've done it twice now. I've stood, I tend to watch the race at the Chatham Fest from the same place in the stand. Since my first Chatham Festival was 1999, I think. Don't give away I, your age now. I basically, oh God, I'm getting on a bit. Uh, I have basically watched the champion hurdle for the last 25, 26, 27 years in the same spot in the stand and the Supreme. In all my life in Cheltenham, I have never seen horses come up the hill and, and come over the last. And basically, look, it's a simple, like, I suppose it's the simplest way of describing it is, he never, ever looks tired. I have never seen a horse come up the, the hill at Cheltenham the way Constitution Hill does. It's like as if he's going down to the start, at the start of the race, when he's coming up the hill. To me, ability-wise, he's the best hurdler I've certainly ever seen. Um, the best chaser I've ever seen was Sprinter Sacra. But to me, he's the best hurdler we've ever seen. And that's why it's just so frustrating that we don't see him that little bit more. But again, as I point at the start, he was probably supposed to run four times this season and now he's going to run three. Well, we could go on and on and on and we could be here until can, the cows come Dave, home. Can I to... one, Dave, can I yes, one you can, of course. Point? Yes, absolutely. Very yeah. quick, very quickly, because it's very interesting with this, the Brack stuff. So if you ask anyone on the streets, like, like who's who's better, or like give just to give them a straight comparison, Constitution and Ista Brack, I think a lot of people would say Ista Brack, but they wouldn't be saying it because of a class thing. Because I think if Constitution Hill ran against a peak Ista Brack, he'd be odds on. They'd be saying it because context is everything. Ista Brack obviously came through in, in, in an era where, you know, Irish winners at Cheltenham weren't as plentiful as they are now. They're actually quite scarce. And they had, it was Aidan O'Brien, it was J.P. McManus, it was Charlie Swan. And it was re- he was a really popular type of horse for that. And obviously he was very good as well, which obviously helps. Constitution Hill, look, I'm not saying Nicky Henderson isn't popular. Of course he's popular, but he's not helping himself with the way he's campaigning the horse now. And I just worry for the horse's legacy and how people view him going forward, that all this kind of, cautiousness and not running them it's not helping the actual the horse's popularity which is absolutely completely unfair to the horse but people just want to see him and i just worry for that going forward and i think that is a kind of wider point to make about him um, and it'll be interesting to see how, how things develop yeah really good conversation and uh, enjoyable guys before we move on to your best bets just a really quick word each because uh, at the time of recording our show this week of course we're uh, on top of the uh, Lawlers of Nace which was cancelled last week quick word in a word who wins it firstly to you Ronan uh, I'll give you more than one word uh, I, I liked on Tubber from an each way thing I think he could run well I think he could outrun his odds but uh, for win purposes I think Firefox um, I, I like him a lot I think he's huge potential up on this trip and obviously his form from Christmas uh, or his form from that fairy house race review Bally Burnt up a huge boost at Christmas so looking forward to seeing him again yeah, and I suppose, uh, David, the form of that race is interesting because I always kind of remember Patrick Mullins when asked, oh, Bally Byrne, mm, yeah, he, he ran okay today, or Willie, one of the two, he ran really well. But I kind of gathered that, you know, he was getting a first run and he was going to improve a lot. Um, mm. Your thoughts on it? Who wins it tomorrow? Who wins the big race? The, the Lawlers? Yeah, I, I just thought when you asked Ronan the question there, you were, you, were, you were narrowing his options when you said, in in a word, who wins? Because that rules out in, in Atlantique, obviously, because it's two <laughs> words. Um, <laughs> uh, look, I think it's fascinating. Um, uh, the vibes from Clyde Sutton are so strong about in Atlantique. Um, but I I just, I, I kind of half fell in love with Firefox the day he was beaten in his maiden hurdle at, at Navin the first day. And, and he's continued to progress ever since, even though he's beaten by Lachlan at, at, at Nace on the second start. But he's won his last four. I think he's getting better. And he's turned into a real pro. So I think I think probably Firefox. The one horse who I've said before, who I think is massively overpriced, is Lecky Watson. He's unorthodox. He basically does everything wrong in a race. 
but he must have a huge amount of ability to get within a half a length of Slade Steel, who I think is probably above uh, on Tober in the re- in the pecking order at uh, at Knockin. So I could see Lecky Watson run a massive race at about twenty to one, but um, yeah, I'm just about in the Firefox camp. But I just hope we have an impressive winner because if we do, we're going to have a, a short price favourite for the Ballymore. I think. Yeah, absolutely. I don't have my hat to put on for Willie Mullins, but I see something like this happening after Elad Lantique wins on Friday. And here we go. Saying, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, yeah, he's got great options, and uh, this horse can run at Cheltenham. He will go to Fairy House. He's an option at Punchestown. Dublin Racing Festival might come a bit too quick, but overall, yeah, we've lots of options. I'm expecting that on Friday, lads, after the race <laughs> in this, but uh, that is going to be the way it's going to go. Right, best bets time, because it is that time of the show, and uh, Roland Groom of the Irish Field, your best bets this weekend. So to uh, Dave, uh, I'm going to go with uh, uh, Donica. He runs on the 12.40 at Warwick. Uh, really like his form. He's got strong form with Impost Trois and he was third to uh, Dante, Go Dante the last day at Cheltenham. I just think that's strong form in the context of the race that he's in. And uh, obviously just dealing with entries for Punchestown on Sunday, but uh, I'm pretty sure this mare will run for Liz Doyle. She was due to run at um, Nace on Sunday before that was uh, called off, and they've basically h- hang back a week and decided not to run at the Nace and running this mare's handicap hurdle. It's a mare called Yabo. Um, I think she's really interesting here, coming off uh, uh, coming off a bit of a break, uh, first time out and going back over hurdles, and she's nine pounds lower than our chase mark as well. Um, I'm pretty sure she'd be declared so i'm going to put her up as the best bet and uh, look out for her on sunday that's in the uh hold on now i'll just get you a race time that's in the 235 punch sound sunday lovely and david your best bets for the weekend uh yeah my nap of the weekend runs in the 215 at weatherby on uh, saturday it's a horse called gunsight ridge for uh ollie murphy and gavin sheehan has actually been booked to ride um i think he goes into the season really well handicapped off mark of 100 100- at the December meeting where he made an early mistake that put him on the back foot. But I think a flat track like Weatherby is tailor-made for him. I actually thought he could turn into a greater chaser. We haven't seen enough of him to know whether he will turn into a greater chaser. But I do think the track, the trip, first time out is the time to catch him. And I think he's well handicapped. So my banker of the weekend, Dave, is in the 2.15 at Weatherby. It's Gunsight Ridge. Hoping for a bit of maybe 11-4, to 3-1. to 1. All right, uh, we're going to take our final ad break of the show before we come back and have a look at nap picks for the weekend. Gorn Park Racecourse, the premier racetrack in the southeast of Ireland, is located on the outskirts of Kilkenny City. Gorn is your number one choice for corporate days out, stag and hint party events, and an overall great local racing experience. Known as the race that stops the county, the famous Goffs Thiestes Chase 2024 takes place on Thursday the 25th of January. In the finish of the Goffs Thiestes, invitation only and Ruby Walsh on the near side for Willie Mullins' seventh win of the race. Invitation only has paid now for his own With packed crowds expected once again this January, you can book your early bird tickets online today. Visit gorenpark.ie online. Click the link in the Champ.ie podcast video description or scan the QR code on screen to purchase right now. Eddie and the team look forward to welcoming you all to Gorham Park Racecourse this winter. Yes, and Syndicate Start Racing, uh, watch out for next week's episode because Jack Cantillon uh, will be joining us, of course. And, uh, well, look at the trainers in which uh, the uh, Syndicate have the horses with, the likes of Willie Mullins, Gordon Elliott, Henry de Bromid, Joseph O'Brien, John McConnell, Gavel Cromwell, and plenty more as well. And don't forget uh, to get your discount code if you'd like to get yourself a share uh, in that. Put in CHAMP, capital letters, apply that code. And you can get yourself involved in, as you can see, all the details are up on screens. And Jack will be with us next week. And just a a little hint for you, there's a nice prize to give away. So do uh, stay tuned. Right, Ronan, let's uh, go to your nap pick uh, for this weekend. We've heard from uh, David uh, Jennings' pick of the Racing Post. Let's get uh, the Irish field angle from Ronan Groom and his nap this weekend. 
Yeah, sorry, I, I, I probably went a bit too soon. It's, it's going to be Dunica. Uh, so did I. <laughs> we, we both hit the front too soon with our naps first. <laughs> you're, going to be like, too, you're going to be like deep. Mr. Doyle. I'm going to have to send the 2E for a Gildan operation next week. <laughs> uh, uh, Dunica for me, 1240. Uh, I, I do like Yabo now, I have to say, it's at, at, at Sunday, but I feel a bit silly putting up an entry if he doesn't, uh, or she doesn't even run, run or doesn't get declared. I think she will be, but so in that case, I'm just going to go for Dunica, uh, 1240. Warwick, I think that his form is is very good in the context of the race, and he's a nice improving horse as well. So that'll do for me. Yeah, and I'm going to go with Apple away this weekend. I think uh, she's got an outstanding chance in that 2.25 at uh, Warwick uh, on Saturday. I think there's plenty more improvement to come. Well, lads, it's been a pleasure, as always. David Jennings, it's been great to have you on as our special guest this week. And uh, looking forward to a superb weekend of racing. Uh, off air, we might continue the Constitution Hill and uh, Easter Brack <laughs> debate for the next couple of hours. Um, Ronan, thank you very much for your contribution this week. Thanks to our sponsors yeah, sure. of the show, Goran Park Racecourse, um, Syndicate Start Racing, and of course our betting partner, Boyle Sports. Barry Doyle, hopefully, will be back next week with us. And uh, more importantly, we'll be making the choice on whether it's cheek pieces or it's headgear for Goran Park on TS this day. Lads, thanks a million. And to all of you out there, we hope you back plenty of winners. Enjoy the, enjoy the weekend's racing. Thanks for listening.